Hello and welcome to Ethics and Leadership for the last online lecture of the course. It's sad, it's so sad. You feel sad? I feel sad. But we shouldn't feel sad because we have lots of things still to talk about, like Bell Hooks and her approach to feminism. So, here's Bell Hooks, different times in her life. Uh, Hooks started out uh, born in a small town, small segregated town in Kentucky, and she went to her primary schooling in a segregated educational system. She then went to Stanford, where she first came into contact with feminist thinking through consciousness raising groups and the slowly developing process of women's studies departments. She went on to gain a master's degree from the University of Wisconsin and eventually ended up at the University of California, Santa Clara. Go banana slugs. That's, that's literally their mascots, the banana slugs. Although the, the banana slugs was only adopted as their official mascot like a few years after she graduated from there. But it's interesting because it does kind of reinforce the banana slug was picked because it was a kind of anti competitive mascot and they didn't have a lot of intercollegiate sports and they wanted to emphasize its communal studying which actually goes very well with Hooks's philosophy. Hooks has written over 30 books on feminism and is one of the leading scholars in the area. Not only that but she's quite a public scholar as well. She's influenced people beyond the academy in a way that most academics never do. So, for instance, you hear her good friend Emma Watson, they're hanging out. If you want to look online, you can actually find lots and lots of stuff that Bell Hooks has done, including public lectures and discussions. And uh, there's even an interview that she and Emma Watson do back and forth. So, you know, if you want to go, look it up. But as always, we aren't interested in that soft, mushy, biographical stuff. We're interested in the ideas. And this is actually something that Bell Hooks would be friendly to. Um, she adopted her pen name, Bell Hooks, from her grandmother. And uh, she put it all in lower case because she didn't want to emphasize the individual author, but she wanted to emphasize the ideas in the books that she writes and all of the things that she does. So leaving off the capitals was kind of a way of leaving off private pride, or at least an attempt to do so. So what's so special about this Bell Hooks lady? Well, in addition to being there at the kind of ground floor of modern feminism, Hooks was also a trailblazing scholar in looking at questions of intersectionality. Now, this is a fancy word for something we've already talked about somewhat, like I've talked about it in terms of the complexity of individual identity and the ways that categories get built up on top of each other as we think about our identities in relation to particular cultural privilege and other areas. But the fancy word for this is intersectionality. So, individual people have identities that are formed in relation to all sorts of different categories and social groups, including things like race, education, sexuality, ability, age, gender, ethnicity, culture, language, class, body type, all sorts of things that you could add into that list. Hook's interest in intersectionality emerged from her concern that feminism had become overly narrowed at some point and became a movement primarily for middle and upper class white women. As these women tended to open up possibilities and move into higher income jobs around the society, although, as we've seen, never as high an income as men. As they moved their way up the social ladder, some people started talking as if feminism had achieved its goals. But Hooks wanted to point out that actually, for many, many women, that wasn't the case at all, because those women were also dealing with a set of other overlapping issues. 
If you recall back to the lecture on racism and sexism, we saw the ways in which white women, while they were still in a pretty dismal condition in relation to net worth compared to men, they were not half as bad off as black women or Latino women. Hooks thus attempted to re-emphasize the importance of female consciousness across all of these other categories so that feminists didn't just move their way up and then think things had been fixed, but instead continued to look at other categories and think about how they all worked together in a hierarchical society. Another emphasis of Hooke's writing has been to emphasize strenuously that feminism is not, as it is often portrayed, a position that opposes men or is simply made up of women who are angry at men. She doesn't deny that certain elements of feminism are driven by anger from particular women at the ways that they have been abused by men and by patriarchal society. An interesting contrast between Hooks and Nussbaum is that Hooks believes that, actually, anger can be a useful emotion in driving people to bring about change in their own society, whereas Nussbaum tends to think of anger as always a problematic emotion. But ultimately, in a similar way to Malcolm X in his later period, Hooks wants to say that feminism is not actually about opposing men, it's about opposing injustice and oppression. Now, in patriarchal society, it is true that men benefit disproportionately from the kinds of advantages that they get out of society, refer back to like male privilege and such in the last lectures. But Hooks doesn't actually think that patriarchal society is good for men or women at the end of the day. This is because human beings for her are naturally equal to each other and flourish in mutual, respectful relationships with each other. So she thinks that coercive, hierarchical relationships of any kind between men, women, classes, all sorts of other coercive, hierarchical relations, they're all harmful to all participants in them, regardless of whether you end up uh, at the top of the hierarchy or at the bottom of the hierarchy. I think it's fair to say that part of the claim of the title of her book, Feminism is for Everybody, is to cash it out in the claim that feminism is actually aimed at liberating both men and women from that coercive hierarchical relationship that culture has given them. So she writes in one place, I feel sad that we have allowed these knee-jerk feminists who want to act like it's a struggle against men. But again, that's the least politically developed strand of feminism. That's the strand of feminism that people hear most about. Now, this goes along with another element of Hooke's thought, which she believes that in a generally patriarchal society, it's not surprising that this is the form of feminism, that kind of anti-man form of feminism, is the form that is most portrayed in public. And she suspects that that's because the patriarchal structures of society recognize that that's kind of the most frightening and problematic form of feminism. And patriarchy doesn't particularly like substantive challenges that might actually get people to move away from patriarchy. Here, as I'll note again later, there's an element of that kind of Marxist idea of ideology or superstructure that societies throw up in order to defend the particular kinds of order that they have within them. Hooks isn't exactly a, a Marxist in any classical sense, but she does take this idea, and I'll come back to it in just a little bit. So if feminism isn't just hating men, well, what is it? Here is one of the most influential definitions of feminism that's been given over the last several decades, provided by Bell Hooks. Feminism is a movement to end sexism, sexist exploitation, and oppression. 
Now, that doesn't, I think, cover all of the specifics of Hooke's version of feminism, but it gives you that kind of broad umbrella concept of what she takes feminism to be. So, if you oppose sexism, sexist exploitation, and the oppression of women, well, there you go. On Hooke's definition, you're a feminist. And this is, as I said, probably the most influential definition of feminism that exists at the present. Now, it's interesting in terms of the categories of our class to try and locate Hooks and Hooks's politics. I mean, she says explicitly that this book, Feminism for Everybody, is about a passionate politics. But that said, kind of hard to nail down, and this actually fits within the tradition of minority political thought that we've seen emerging from Wollstonecraft and Douglas through Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois and on to Malcolm X and even Martin Luther King Jr. Because on the one hand, they want to grab hold of particular elements of the liberal tradition, and they want to expand that in ways that the liberal tradition hasn't always itself accepted. So, even going back to Marx, you'll remember that I suggested that in many ways, Marx is an expansion of the liberal tradition, that he doesn't actually fight against most of the ideas, but tries to expand out the concern for oppression that was in Locke, the removal of individual rights, and expand that to recognize that other structures can also be in play coercing and oppressing people, like economic structures. So, in some similar way to all of this, we can find Bell Hooks as both an advocate of the liberal system and as trying to articulate a critique of the way that current society is set up. So, for instance, times that she picks up on the language of the liberal tradition includes discussions about rights. Feminism, she says, is about rights, about women gaining equal rights. And this goes back to one of those things that she thinks that some people get wrong about feminism when they think of it as just about hatred of men or putting women above men. She says, no, it's actually about rights. It's about gaining equal rights for women. She also draws explicitly on that liberal Lockean tradition in talking about original natural equality. So she says feminism will make it possible for us to be fully self-actualized females and males, able to create beloved community, to live together, realizing our dreams of freedom and justice, living the truth that we are all created equal. But at the same time, Hooks definitely thinks of herself as a revolutionary, as a revolutionary feminist. And that requires locating herself against some of the manifestations of the liberal tradition as it's come out in our society. And, as a matter of fact, this works itself out even internal to the different versions of feminism that she sees. So she wants to distinguish her own revolutionary feminism from reformist feminism. And this distinction, the revolutionary versus the reformist, is a distinction that comes from the development of Marxist ideas after Marx. So on the one hand, we can think about those revolutionaries, and, and here, in some sense, we can think about all the way back to, like, Wollstonecraft and her arguments with Edmund Burke. So Wollstonecraft was in favor of the French Revolution. She believed that human beings had the knowledge to know about their natural rights and to claim that, even if it required overthrowing systems of government and established systems of hierarchy in their society. Whereas Burke suggested, you no, know, being a kind of traditionalist, uh, people don't really know that much and they need to, to progress slowly by means of, like, reforming their own structures. So, on this dichotomy, it seems like the reformists are those who accept, like, these small little steps in hopes that it'll bring about change eventually, but they don't expect to actually change the entire system. 
and we can see these ideas in Bell's own discussion. So, reformist feminists wanted to project a vision of a movement as being solely about women gaining equality with men in the existing system. This is to suggest that some forms of feminism don't go far enough in changing the actual structure of the society and the ways that we think about things to be effective in bringing about a true equality between males and females. And though this is a bit out of context, we could actually draw this back as even a criticism of the kind of feminism that Wollstonecraft represented, where, say, she suggested that women just needed to be as rational as men, and so she accepted the fundamental dichotomy of rationality and emotion, but she just said then women need to accept the way that the society is in terms of rationality being on top, and women just need to claim that. Well, no doubt, like Nussbaum, Hooks would want to say, no, we ought to, in fact, challenge that basic dichotomy. And similarly with Wollstonecraft's approach to marriage, where she said, okay, what we need is to transform the marriage into more of a friendship, so less emotional. But women still remain obligated to get married and have children. Well, Hooks would say that was accepting too much of the system to start with. Now, for Hooks, this overlaps with her concern for intersectionality, because she's worried that, especially if you're a white female, you might be fine in a society that has economically coercive structures, because it doesn't affect you as much, and so those who are privileged in some ways will, in fact, accept the basic structures of society as long as the society allows them to get ahead. So, as she suggests, if you live in a society that has kind of white supremacist or racist structures embedded in it, well, those structures will be more open to white women moving their way up than it will be to black women. And so, certain versions of feminism will, in fact, become acceptable in the society before other versions of feminism. This is one of Hooke's complaints about the way that arguments about abortion ended up becoming central to feminism. Now, don't get me wrong, she in fact believes that, and we'll come back to this, that in order to be a, a feminist, at least a revolutionary feminist, that you can't actually negotiate on abortion. But she doesn't actually like that abortion became the central issue. And she suggests that the reason that abortion became the central issue was because it was an issue for middle and upper class white women. Whereas minority women and women of lower economic class had broader concerns about health care and reproductive health. But with abortion being the primary issue of those upper class and more privileged members of the feminist movement, it eventually got narrowed down to a question of abortion. Hooks wants to recognize that as an important element of feminism, but she wants to broaden that out to be about all sorts of issues of women's health, not just abortion. Hooks also locates her revolutionary feminism as opposed to lifestyle feminism. And here we'll come back to the abortion thing. So she locates lifestyle feminism as uh, identified with the notion that there could be as many versions of feminism as there were women. Now, in some sense, there's no doubt that she agrees that feminism, even revolutionary feminism, can be, in fact, extremely diverse, especially on the level of individual choices. Being a feminist doesn't mean, as an individual, you need to be pro-marriage, anti-marriage, pro-abortion, anti-abortion, for wearing high heels, against wearing high heels, for wearing makeup, against wearing makeup, etc. Hooks thinks that in some sense, feminism does represent a kind of libertarian principle for individual women, where they ought to be able to make their own choices about things. But Hooks doesn't believe that this leads to the conclusion that feminism as a matter of public policy should be about endorsing just whatever you want. So, while she believes that individual women should be able to make decisions about abortion themselves, and in fact categorizes herself as one of those women who is not clearly, like, 
pro-abortion, she also holds that if you really want to be feminist, you have to be able to defend the negative right of women to be able to make this choice. So, on Hook's account, there is no such thing as a feminist who favors laws getting rid of legal abortion, even though there may be women who are feminists who would never have an abortion themselves and, in fact, think that there's something wrong with abortion as a personal issue. Another element of her rejection of lifestyle feminism is the fact that she thinks that patriarchal and hierarchical structures can be built into people by the culture. And this is an idea that we've, you know, come back and forth about all the way since Plato. But she certainly believes that women can be sexist, just as men, it's entirely possible, can be not sexist. Hooks, in fact, goes so far as to claim that the most patriarchal voice in her life early on was her own mother. And the idea here is that her mother assumed the standards of the patriarchal society around her and didn't particularly challenge them, and encouraged her own children to grow up accepting the standards of the society around them. So there, Hooks wants to say, yeah, not every female is a feminist, regardless of their own positions, politically or even personally. So, in saying feminism is for everybody, Hooks is not saying, well, everybody's really a feminist. As she herself claims, that we have to have some standards of feminists. Another category of feminism that Hooks mentions, I think just once in the reading that you have, but she mentions occasionally is power feminism. And the relationship of revolutionary feminism to power feminism is actually a little bit more complicated. So power feminism emerged in the 1990s, and it emerged as a reaction to what some of the early power feminists called victim feminism. And here, in part, we go back to the question of victimization, where, okay, if we focus on the ways in which the society holds a group of people down, do we, in fact, encourage them simply to act as victims or identify themselves as victims? And does this disempower them? Does this take away their autonomy and take away their sense that they can do something about their own situation? Now, Hooks's feminism is complicated in relation to this in that she certainly doesn't embrace a kind of victim feminism. As a matter of fact, I think most feminists would question whether victim feminism was, in fact, a useful category in describing what feminism was. But regardless, Hooks is in favor of powerful women. The idea that she's in favor of revolutionary feminism suggests that, you know, she's revolutionary. That doesn't happen without, like, agency. But she doesn't cash this out exactly the same way that power feminists did. So power feminists, in emphasizing agency, at times became, like, individualists, more like libertarians. So they emphasized that the individual woman needed to pick herself up and apply herself and claim that they could in fact get ahead by putting themselves out there and, and putting themselves into, you know, the work and the society. Well, here we can go back to the arguments between uh, W.E.B. Du Bois and, say, Booker T. Washington, where Washington had emphasized the virtue of industry as itself sufficient in order to raise black people up through the society. Whereas Du Bois said, no, that's just, I mean, it's a necessary element in the entire process, but it's not sufficient. You have to challenge the structures of society. Hooks in this takes more of Du Bois's position and says, yeah, this isn't going to work all by itself. Now, it might work, she notes, especially for, like, upper middle class women who, by asserting themselves, actually can move themselves up the social ladder more easily. But this still continues to ignore those people who are more at the bottom of the hierarchies of society. And for them, it's just not enough to simply say, well, work harder. You've got to change something about the way that the society is set up so as to enable their work to actually produce something. 
there's also a worry here about the basic element of individualism internal to feminism. So power feminism could be used to allow a woman to get ahead herself and then decide that what other women needed to do were, in fact, simply to work harder just like they had worked harder. And so they decide that they're not going to do anything to help those who continue to be in lower status in the society. Hooks imagination of powerful women rejects this kind of individualism. She believes in powerful women, but believes in powerful women in solidarity with each other. So her emphasis on sisterhood, for instance, suggests that women can be powerful, but they need to be powerful as a group, in solidarity with each other, not as individuals thinking that they can go it alone. So Hooke's vision is for revolutionary feminism, internal to that broader definition of feminism that she provided earlier. And what does this revolutionary feminism look like? Now here I think she goes beyond her earlier definition of feminism to say something more. And take, for instance, this quote. Feminist sisterhood is rooted in sharing commitment to the struggle against patriarchal injustice no matter the form that injustice takes. Well, what's happening here in part is a broadening of the notion of feminism and what feminism opposes. So we might say here that feminism is actually becoming opposition to the structures of society that hold women down, any women. That means if some women are held down by economic structures, well, then feminism will be worried about helping those women out. And if some women are held down by racist structures, well, feminism will be worried about helping those women out. Feminism, on this broader account, is really about opposition to any form of injustice or oppression that affects any women. And at times in Hooke's writing, patriarchy just becomes a kind of name for all the different structures that might be holding women down, regardless of whether those are explicitly or exclusively focused on the category of sex. Now, when Hooks is a little bit more careful to distinguish out the structures that she's mostly focused on producing oppression and injustice in the society, she will say things like what she opposes is imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy. Now, each one of those phrases is then a qualifier on the idea of patriarchy. What kind of patriarchy are we talking about? Well, an imperialist patriarchy. What kind of patriarchy are we talking about? Well, a white supremacist patriarchy. What kind of patriarchy are we talking about? Well, a capitalist patriarchy. And all of this fits into what she's talking about when she talks about patriarchy, at least in her own context. So let's do a little bit to break these down, the different things that are at play in that big long thing that she opposes. So, first of all, patriarchy. Well, in The Will to Change, she says, patriarchy is a political social system that insists that males are inherently dominating, superior to everything and everyone deemed weak, especially females, and endowed with the right to dominate and rule over the weak and to maintain that dominance through various forms of psychological terrorism and violence. Now, to see patriarchy at work, we don't have to go very far. We don't even have to leave this set of lectures. You remember all the way back to Aristotle employing that kind of reason is over the body distinction. And, of course, the idea is that the mind is supposed to control the body. If the body is doing its own thing, say if your arm starts jerking out to the side, right, this is a body out of control, not actually being, I mean, I just did that, but with, but I, but I, my, if it was unintentional, right, the body would be out of control, and so the mind ought to, in fact, employ this on the body. And going back to Plato's distinction between the reason and the appetites, although Plato was actually a little bit more egalitarian in his discussion of the relation between the guardians, you remember that he put reason over the appetites and suggested that reason should be like the charioteer and the appetites like the, the horse that's out of control and he needs to pull back on that horse even if it makes the 
spit bite into the horse's mouth so that it bleeds, right? Well, if that's the kind of image that you have of males and females, it's pretty patriarchal. And this continues on. So think about the Romans who had that virtus that was their primary virtue, and that's like manliness, and the man was the head of the household and controlled the household below him, which included like everything, including slaves and his wife and other females. In Roman sexuality, it really does get to be about domination. So in it? Roman society, they thought about the sexual act of penetration as an act of power, and they thought about being penetrated as a symbol of weakness, so that after a battle, if an army won, sometimes they would sodomize their opponents simply to show them that they had dominated them. And fast forward to Machiavelli, who talked about, like, beating Fortuna, that woman, so that you could take control over your own fortune as a man with the virtue of virtu. And then on to Locke and the liberal tradition, which, when it articulated the rights of men, did it fairly narrowly, at least it was interpreted, so that it actually went to white landowning males and didn't recognize females as the kind of beings that should, in fact, govern themselves. And, as we've seen in our lectures about racism and sexism, there still are today these forms of sexism where powerful men feel that, you know, it's okay to go around and, like, literally penetrate women if they have coercive power over them. And even if you could get rid of that explicit, old-fashioned sexism, there would still be implicit sexism. And this comes out in studies that show things like well, we're more likely to trust a man when they tell something to us than we are to trust a woman. It's built into our psyches at some point. So this is central to what Bell Hooks is opposing. But if you just think about patriarchy all by itself, then you won't see a lot of the ways that women are in fact disadvantaged in contemporary society. And that's because a lot of women are not just white women, but there are black and Latino women and other minorities that in fact end up, as we've seen, stacked under multiple of those categories of oppression. And so, even if it were the case that we saw some women, you know, achieving equality with men, and we've mentioned that there are some women who become CEOs of major companies, right? So there's some, yeah, well, that doesn't actually address the fundamental question, because there are still structures that are holding women down, and we might need to look more carefully about which women are being held down in which situations. Hook's anti-capitalism brings us back to the issue of Marxism and how to locate her in relation to Marxism and the critique of capitalism that we saw developing at the end of Martin Luther King's life and Malcolm X's life and continually influencing the way that political philosophy works out. Well, here's a useful quote that I found. I think Marxists thought the work of people like Gramercy is very crucial to educating ourselves for political consciousness. We extract the resources from their thought that can be useful to us in struggle. A class-rooted analysis is where I begin in all my work. The fact is that it was bourgeois white feminism that I was reacting against when I stood in my first women's studies classes and said, black women have always worked. It was a class-based challenge to the structure of feminism. Now, going back, you might not recognize the name Gramercy. That's Antonio Gramercy, who was a, a later kind of a neo-Marxist thinker in Italy. And he focused especially on the ways that superstructure builds itself into a kind of hegemonic culture. And so you have to be able to interpret and decode the ways that the structure of society defends itself. And we've already seen that Hooks is interested in doing exactly this, kind of questioning the bases of the society and the ways that there are philosophical justifications for particular forms of what she sees as oppression. But note also that she says that when you're approaching Marxism, you take what's useful to you in your own struggle. It's not that she is a Marxist, exactly. 
but she certainly is worried about class, and again, this has to do with her emphasis on intersectionality and internal to feminism. So when early feminists were arguing for the right to work, she wanted to remind them, actually, black women have been working for a long time. So while that might be your struggle, it's not exactly our struggle. Maybe while we're fighting for the rights of white women to go out and work and find their own livelihood, maybe we also ought to be fighting for black women to have better livelihoods. Maybe feminism requires that we think about how to redistribute goods in our society in light of an unjust distribution when we start out. Further, Hooks opposes imperialism. And this is another idea that we've been going back and forth about since early on in the course when I suggested that Aristotle has a conception of the Greek city-states as civilized human beings. And by the time we get to Rome, really, if you're really fully human, uh, that means you're Roman. And this thought that, that your culture is always exceptional, that your culture is always the one that has the true picture of humanity, enables the justification of your culture going out and dominating other cultures. So this happened during the imperial period with England going out and dominating places in India, and you get the whole Gandhi thing that happens over there, and Africa, and, you know, everybody taking over the Middle East, and that's a whole mess that we don't really want to get into. So, for Hooks, the problem of imperialism is the problem of one culture thinking that they're exceptional and going out and dominating other cultures. Imperialism is also tied to the idea of nationalism, which she believes can cut you off from fellow feelings of humanity beyond your own nation. Nationalism might allow you to think well, that you don't have the same moral obligation to those people in other nations that you have to people in your own nation. And this is, again, an issue that we've been bumping up against. You'll remember that one of the innovations of utilitarianism was to say that every individual who feels pleasure or pain is, in fact, equally worthy of attention, regardless of where they are. That doesn't make any difference. Well, Hooks opposes a nationalism that would stop us from paying attention to the well-being of people outside of our nation, and she thinks that that kind of nationalism is incompatible with feminism, as feminists should be deeply concerned about females no matter where they live. That's part of solidarity. So she writes, I think that nationalism has undermined revolutionary black struggle. It's no accident that people like Malcolm X and Martin Luther King were destroyed at the moments in their political careers when they had begun to criticize nationalism as a platform of organization, and where, in fact, they replaced nationalism with a critique of imperialism, which then unites us with the liberation struggle of so many people on the planet. The redemptive location lies in our radical politics and in the strategies by which we implement those radical politics, not with the formation of nations. So how do you start a revolution? Well, Hooks thinks that the best example was actually given early on in feminism, where there were consciousness-raising groups, and here you might think back, appropriately enough, to the communist emphasis on the rise of class consciousness. Right? Now, certainly Hooks rejects that and suggests that class is not the only category that people should be paying attention to, but she agrees that groups need to develop a sense of their own consciousness, and in that process, develop a sense in which they're built into the structures that might actually hold people like them in positions of oppression. So she sees these early consciousness-raising groups as places where there were mutual and caring relationships between people that allowed them to be able to talk about difficult subjects and allowed them to be self-critical about what 
part they participated in in the systems of their world. These were groups that allowed people to get over some of those triggering reactions to discussions about oppression and privilege and all of this stuff because the people got together and had personal relationships. They weren't just fighting it out on Facebook. Now, Hooks recognizes that what happened eventually was that this moved into the academy. And in some senses, that was a positive development. It institutionalized some of the consciousness raising, but it also shifted the basis of the movement away from a kind of radical feminism that focused on raising questions about all elements of the culture and the structures in which you live and put it in an institutional frame. And immediately what happens here is that in academia, you're privileged because of your education. So people who were lower class women tended not to be able to get PhDs and get long-term places in the academy. And since the center of weight had shifted to the academy, there was a tendency, again, of white females to rise to the top in leadership over the feminist project. Ultimately, she sees this as part of that narrative where feminism lost its early revolutionary character and gave way to reformist versions and lifestyle versions and eventually the kind of power feminism that emerged in the 1990s. Hooks would like to develop something more basic, the kind of popular education for females that went back to something like consciousness raising. Now, I've been throwing revolutionary around here a lot, and I early on contrasted the revolutionary character of, say, Marxist and the French Revolution against the kind of slow reformist character of Burke's conservatism. But it's important to note here that Hooks is not really revolutionary, say, in the sense that even Malcolm X was revolutionary. I mean, Malcolm X articulated a moral justification for violence, whereas Hooks doesn't think that revolution has to take that character. She does believe in revolution in the sense that you should be overturning the structures of society, but she doesn't believe in doing that violence. As a matter of fact, her own political process is influenced by the politics of Martin Luther King Jr. and the Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh, both of whom were advocates of nonviolence. So, she says, what Martin Luther King wants me to do today is to go out into the world and in every way that I can, small and large, build a beloved community. That certainly requires standing up to unjust structures in society, protesting against them. Martin Luther King's politics were never passive politics, even if they were nonviolent politics. But Hooks is consistently against coercion, and violence would in fact tie into the kind of society that she doesn't want. It's also worth noting that Hooks is non-utopian. So oftentimes she speaks in extremely broad terms about politics of love and mutual respectful relationships as being the ideal of the politics that we should be aiming for. But at the same time, she recognizes that that's not going to happen immediately. And in the face of contemporary structures, you ought to do what you can do. So this might mean moderating the structures that you're already a part of. In one part of Feminism is for Everybody, she looks at a case where women were getting together in some of their consciousness-raising groups and thinking about situations where upper-class women hired lower-class women in order to do housework or child care. Some of those women successfully created positive bonding between themselves and the women they hired so that there could be mutual advancement in a larger context of inequality, rather than abandoning the vision of sisterhood because they could not attain some utopian state. So while Hooke's ethics are revolutionary in that they aim at bringing about change in the basic structures of a hierarchical society,
she does recognize that there will be intermediate steps that are necessary while that kind of hierarchy exists. So her objection to reformist feminism is more that they're simply too happy with the steps that they achieve. She wants to remind us that feminism is never finished and should never be satisfied until women are freed from all coercive hierarchical relationships of oppression. All right, so let's put bell hooks in the context of the themes for our class. Human nature. Human beings are capable of goodness, but are corrupted by hierarchical systems of imperialism, capitalism, racism, and patriarchy. Social or individual. Humans are social, gaining their identities in relation to the many social groups with which they are identified. In the current system, what we need is the development of consciousness on the bottom side of unjust social hierarchies. People and property. I don't know of any place where Hooks articulates a theory of property, and so I can't speak to whether in the abstract she believes in private property rights for individuals, etc. So here's what I think we can say about her position. Property should be subject to redistribution in unjustly ordered societies that might allow for minimal property rights or limited property rights, as we've seen in Rawls or Nussbaum, or, you know, might go further than that. Equality or inequality. Well, humans are naturally equal, but are subject to unnatural hierarchical relations that are harmful to all participants, at least as society sets today, and her politics are, in part about getting rid of those coercive hierarchies. The shape of government, and here's another area where I don't know that she's ever articulated an abstract theory of government, but I think we can say some things about the kind of position she would take on government. Government should be radically democratic, as in anti-hierarchical, or at least against coercive hierarchies. It should be based upon mutual and genuine relationships of love. But... While this is the ideal, we do not wait upon it for action. We attempt to make things better wherever we are and internal to whatever structures we find ourselves. The purpose of government, the same qualifications. Government should protect and provide for the equal rights of all its citizens. It should also create a shared sense of commitment to the project of humanity. It should not endorse national exceptionalism or imperialism. It should address unjust distribution of goods. Now, there's lots of other things that she might want to say about government, but I think those are fair things that fit with her position in general. And what authorizes leadership. Leadership should always be understood in the context of relationships of mutual respect and love. It should not be coercive or hierarchical. It should lead towards the fulfillment of all persons involved. All right, so that's bell hooks and that's the class for the most part. Um, let me close by thanking you for coming along with me, at least virtually, you know, via the videos, and uh, I'll say a couple more things about the class in general. So one danger of presenting the class as we have is the thought of different people as you go through is that you might just come out on the other end as more of an ethical relativist, where you're like, well, different people just think different things about government. I hope that that's not the case. Because the goal of the class is actually to provide you with your own moral toolbox that you can kind of draw from. And in order to do that adequately, hopefully it's led you to think critically about all of these different figures that we've looked at. I mean, I, mean, I would say that I don't agree with all of any particular theorist's ideas. But I find all of their thought useful in thinking about society and justice. So I've articulated what some of my own conclusions are as we've gone through the lectures. But those are not binding on you any more than the thought of the other theorists that we've talked about in class. In some ways, the goal here goes all the way back to Aristotle, who suggested that 
people ought to live well-rounded lives, and that by preparing them to live well-rounded lives, we prepare them for one of the most important duties that they have, which is the duty of participating in politics. In American society, as opposed to Aristotle society, we don't have a small group of people, the Aristos, who are the rulers of the society, we have a democracy, and that means that we really ought to prepare everybody for participation in politics. That's part of the idea behind a liberal education to start with, that liberal education, which doesn't mean liberal in the political sense, but is the education of the freed person. So I've tried to drag you up out of the cave, show you the ideological shadows on the wall in front of you that maybe you'd taken for granted up to this point. What you take from it, of course, is in large part up to you. After all, we live in a democracy that's dominated by negative rights, so I can't really, you know, force you to do much of anything. But I do hope that you've learned something and maybe even had a little bit of fun on the way. So, for this class, I bid you adieu.